Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cloud Native Wasm Day. In this talk, we want to talk about Cloud Native serv serverless functions and how what role, if any, web assembly can play in here. Okay. So, um, well, before we start, let's look at what is a serverless function. Serverless function, you know, the first serverless function that's well known is AWS Lambda, right? You know, that's a, it's a new paradigm of developing. You know, that's you just upload your code. And uh, you don't need to know where it's running and what's the operating system it's running and, and any detail about the server. The public cloud will just run it and uh, uh, API, uh, a URL or something else that for you to call this function and get a result, right? So that's um, what we call no infrastructure. And uh, um, it's because the developer don't see the server, we, we call it serverless. Although obviously there's still server on the back end, just serverless is just making servers great again, right? You know, so that's, uh, um, if you look at this survey that from Datadog, you know the Lambda adoption of among AWS users has gone really sky high. I'm 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 actually surprised to see this. Half of AWS users have adopted Lambda. If you consider how many products AWS actually have, you know that's uh, um, it's amazing. That's something that there's something like that can be adopted by half of all users on AWS. It's the same for the other cloud as well. So let's um, look at the leading cloud in China. You know, AWS is uh, is leading cloud in America. So this um, I translated this um, the paragraph of Chinese words for you. So you know, Tencent Cloud is the leading cloud um, is the leading cloud provider in China. Has over one million developers, provide services to ten thousand businesses, including five hundred large enterprises. How many serverless function calls it sees per day? Ten billion calls per day. You know, there's uh, people are writing a large number of you know um, high traffic, heavily used applications using Tencent Cloud Serverless as a back as a backend service. Right, so that's it shows us that's really popular, and the developers really want to use it. Right, and uh, so what are the most programming languages in those? Um, you know, what's what the developers use when they write serverless functions, and they use you know, Python and Node.js, no surprise here. Those are, I wouldn't call them easy languages, but those are high productivity languages, right? You know, it's easy to write applications in those languages, but they are also heavyweight languages, meaning that they have a heavy runtime and uh, has um, somewhat slow performance, right? So, you know, so that's the developers write those applications and you, um, in Python and Node.js. Uh, probably without thinking a lot about the application uh, about the performance, and that shows the duration of lambda functions. You know the the this figure said it in a way that is uh, glass half full, right? Half of the lambda functions runs less than eight hundred milliseconds. My reaction is, oh gosh, half of the lambda functions run more than eight hundred milliseconds. Meaning, so if you um, think about you know how high performance internet web, how high performance website works. If you consider, you know the the time need for the data to travel through the network to um, to reach the customer and then to, uh, to go from the client to the server and then back, you know to spend 800.8 seconds on the server, it's a very very long time, especially if you have an application that makes 10, 20, or even hundreds of backend services calls. You know that could really add up. So you know, so that's actually that's actually one of the other things that somewhat surprised me is that you know the way that people use serverless functions are tends to be that I think that's on the next slide. So the most common serverless function use case is to run a simple function on a heavy stack. So the stack, you know, no Python and Node.js are slow and takes a long time, and uh, that in turn only allows people to run simple functions. You know, you can only run a, a, a fairly simple function and it's gonna take 800 milliseconds. So that translates to what? You know, that translates to there's only limited number of use cases that we can actually use serverless functions. Meaning, you know, in AWS, in most public clouds, it's used as the glue code. You know, when you need to move something from AWS S3 to the AWS message queue, you know, something like that. The best way to do it is to use a serverless function because it's uh, um, it's sitting in the message queue and uh, um, it's not very time sensitive, and it's uh, there's no one else that waiting for a real time response from it. So, in those cases where you know you can write, you know, 
Python and J Node.js applications and not really care about their performance. And uh, you know, e each function call takes maybe a second, right? You know, or, or more. So that's um, that's the, today's most common use case of serverless. However, as we can imagine, you know, because serverless is such a powerful paradigm, and uh, a lot of developers would love to use it. And uh, a lot of developers actually want to write full applications in serverless. You know, there's a there's a new you know new way of developing web application called the JAM stack, and JAM stack, right? If you haven't heard of it, you probably already done it. You know, that's because I think most new web application today I see actually what's do what's done in that fashion. You know, so it's uh, um, so on one, on the front end there is a static website generator. So you have frameworks like Vue or Next.js or Hugo, something like that. So then it took the content um, that you wrote in some kind of markup and generate a static website with JavaScript in it. And that static website can be deployed anywhere you want. It can be deployed on the local host, for instance. It can be deployed on CDN, or it can be deployed even on blockchain, right? You know, that's uh, um, you know, you can deploy it anywhere you want because those are just a bunch of HTML files and JavaScript. And the JavaScript contact the backend service to provide uh, functions for this for this static UI, right? You know, so you have a, a web page, and then JavaScript goes to call some backend function to do things like you know image recognition or you know uh, saving data to the database, you know, things of that nature. And that backend function is typically a serverless function, right? You know, so that's if we see it from that lens, you know, that's you want we want to use serverless. As um, as a universal backend service, we would want it to be much faster and uh, much lighter. And uh, basically, it, it needs to have a different performance characteristics than what, what serverless is today. Right? It's uh, it shouldn't take eight hundred milliseconds. It shouldn't even take eighty milliseconds. It should be a lot more faster, ten times, a hundred times faster than that. Right? So you know, so that's uh, um, where we think you know that's um, the current. Um, model or the current paradigm of serverless can really get some help. You know that's uh, um, you know that's where we think uh, cloud native WebAssembly could have um, could have an impact. Okay, or could contribute to um, to this whole thing. So um, before as we get into how WebAssembly could help, let's take some time to review what are the serverless runtimes, popular serverless runtimes. You know the first is what we call hypervisor VM or hardware VM. It's you know, some people call it micro VMs as well, like AWS Firecracker, right? That is uh, how AWS Lambda was run. You know, that's it provide hardware based, um, you know, it provides a high level of isolation for each of the serverless instances. And, you know, so the serverless is contained within a VM and that, but that is very inefficient because you start a whole operating system just, and then the, the software stack on the operating system just run a single function and then shut it down. Right, you know, that's uh, to start it up may take a second, and then the the function may only take ten milliseconds, and then you know, ninety nine percent of the work in this process is wasted, or it's it's infrastructure busy work. So although that provides safety and security, that's um, not very efficient. So some people it starts to use application containers like Docker to do that, and Docker is a lot faster than the hardware VM, but it also provides less isolation. And and also, be, although the doc, the Docker runs on top of operating system, it also has a guest operating system inside it. So it takes it still takes time to get up the operating system and the software stack. So it so although it's faster than hardware VM, it's, it still takes time to prepare the environment. Then the third level, the highest abstraction level, is to run high level language VMs in a thread. So the most classic example is the JVM. And uh, you know the Java virtual machine, but it's also the the Python runtimes, the V8 for for Node.js, and of course WebAssembly. You know the common thing about those high level VMs is that they don't have operating system in it. The type of code it that can run in this in this in this type of VMs are called bytecode, so they are already defined and formatted, and uh, there's a compiler that generates those bytecode, and then those VMs can be started really fast in the in a running operating system in a thread and then can be shut down really fast as well. So that makes them most nimble and makes them least wasteful and allows us to write high performance applications in those, um, in those high level language VMs. So as you can see here, you know, you probably have heard of JVM, Python, but you know, that's WebAssembly is also here. And, and uh, what we think is WebAssembly gonna be 
probably the best VM that's run serverless functions. And uh, it's not just us that thinks that, you know, in 2019, you know, it's, it's hard to believe, two, um, you know, more than two years ago now, um, the founder of Docker and the CTO of, you know, the first CTO of Docker said, if WebAssembly, WASM, WASM stands for WebAssembly, if WebAssembly plus WASI existed in 2008, we wouldn't have needed to create a Docker. You know, that's how important it is. Uh, WebAssembly on the server is the future of computing. That's how important it is. That's, I thought that's very strong words, right? You know, that's uh, um, a standardized system interface was the missing piece. Let's hope WASI is up to the task. We'll talk about what WASI is in a minute. So we have made the claim that WebAssembly is faster than Docker. Docker is faster than hardware VM and a micro VM. We're, um, you know, there's lots of research and lots of data that shows that we, we, we don't want to go in, you know, that's, um, um, you know, that's, um, we we'll just take that as fact. But the comparison between WebAssembly and Docker is interesting. You know, that's a, that's a study that we did, uh, you know, uh, our team did, and we published the result in IEEE software last year. It shows the performance of, uh, of WebAssembly versus Docker in different scenarios. The blue bars are SSVM, which is our implementation of WebAssembly, our open source implementation of WebAssembly. Uh, we're going to talk about SSVM in a minute, in a minute as well. And uh, the orange bar is Docker plus native, meaning that's, it's a dark, it's a bare bone Docker image. And then we run a native application on top of that image. The native application is written in C and compile to, um, to run whatever the guest operating system Docker has. And then the green bar is Docker plus Node.js. It's Docker runs a high level programming language and high, uh, runs a heavy stack, right? Uh, to perform the exact same functions. So the nope is, the nope function is to just start and shut down to measure startup time. And, uh, the blue bar is actually invisible. So we have to multiply it by 50, you know, so in order to just for it to show up on the, on the, on the plot. So from here, we can see in, in terms of startup time, although Docker improves significantly from micro VMs, it's a thousand times slower than WebAssembly. You know, WebAssembly just can start and stop in a very, very quickly without, um, you know, that's, uh, um, it hardly consumes any time. But with Docker, you know, that's, uh, um, you're still talking about tens of milliseconds just to start up the, um, just to start the container. And then you have to run the application that's, uh, that's written in a slow language on top of it, right? So from there, that's, that's already, you know, I think over, over 100 times, you know, performance gains right there. And then for the application that's actually, the CPU intensive application that actually runs inside the containers, we could see, um, unsurprisingly, Node.js performs the worst because you know that's, uh, it's written in JavaScript. What do you expect, right? Docker plus native is comparable to SSVM, but SSVM is still faster. So even for for runtime tasks, you know, WebAssembly container plus its you know its um, sandbox bytecode, it's still about 10, 20 percent faster than Docker plus fully native code. You know, so that means, you know, if we, if we do a performance comparison, WebAssembly is, you know, faster than Docker across board. And that solves the dilemma that we, um, that we raised in the beginning of our talk is to say, how do we make serverless functions start up faster and run faster so that it can be more versatile? So that it's not just uh, the glue code to connect different systems. We make it uh, a universal backend for, um, for Jamstack applications, right? So, you know, that's, here we show that WebAssembly at least has the potential because it is fast. So cloud native WebAssembly use cases. And uh, so those are the partners that we work with, you know, um, at second state. Obviously there are other use cases, but I can only talk about things that I actually know, right? You know, so those are our customers and partners. And then the first category, of course, is Jamstack web applications. WebAssembly helps here by providing a, a universal runtime that we can deploy, not only on the cloud, but also on the edge in a CDN network as a compute node, right? That allows gems, the Jamstack application, the serverless based Jamstack applications to, have, to reach high performance, right? You know, then we have SaaS and PaaS. That's a, also an interesting use case is because, you know, one of the common thing about SaaS application is the need to customize and extend it for different customers, right? And today, people do it with the API, uh, with callback APIs, meaning that's the, the events that happen in the SaaS. Someone did something on the SaaS platform, could be sent to a 
external server, and then developer runs that server, and then the developer provide a response from that server and it goes back to the SaaS um, interface. Just imagine, uh, say, a chatbot, right? You know, uh, in the messaging application, you know, how do you how do you create a chatbot for a messaging SaaS application? You know, you have uh, you, you have an API based approach where you know um, when when a message was sent to a user, uh, something happened inside in, inside of that messaging system. The messaging system will forward this message to the server to, to an external server that you run, and then the developer, the the application runs on the server, sees this message and generates some kind of response and send it back into into the messaging application, and then the messaging application translates that into a message and send it back to the to the user. It's it's response to it, right? So in that scenario. You know, um, we have a chatbot, but we also have an external uh, server side application that runs side to side with the SaaS. And uh, um, isn't it, let's reimagine how this might be run in a serverless environment. Why do we need the developer to set up a server that on the side? You know, that's, uh, it's tedious work, it's expensive, it's tedious. And uh, it's, it's also error prone because, you know, the server might be done and all that. Why can't the developer just to submit a piece of code, just to submit a function into the SaaS platform and say, this function responds to an incoming message, right? You know, so if if anyone send a message to to any of my, to my users, call this call this function, and this function takes a string as input and returns a string as output. So something like to apply the serverless model into a SaaS application, you would be able to get rid of most of the callback APIs and most of the API complexities when people extend those SaaS applications. So that's um, that's that's something we are also very excited. You know, that we work with some SaaS providers. That's um, for 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 this very purpose, right? You know, of course, there's uh, IoT devices and cars. You know, there's um, um, you know um, in the automobile operating system, there's lots of um, places where you know, the, the, the sub-module or subsystem is developed by someone else. It's by a supplier or by a, by a, by a part supplier or by integrator. And then it needs to be integrated together in a system that's, that's, um, that's, um, that can run together without interfering with, with each other. And one of the ways to do that, of course, is to use Docker. You know, that's, uh, um, so, you know, say you have a, you have a, a electric car and uh, it has a it, it has a subsystem that come from a different manufacturer um, that controls the window, for instance, the power window that goes up and down. You know the logic of how the window goes up and down could needs to be run inside a container because it cannot be allowed to interfere with the drivetrain system or the autonomous driving system or the braking system or whatever. Right? You know that's uh, when the when the window with the software that controls the window crashes, it cannot crash the car. So. In that scenario, you need something that like Docker, right? You know, that's a software container and WebAssembly being able to run a variety of different um, hardware and operating systems, including real-time operating system, provide a very good candidate for that. You know, that's uh, it allows those um, those um, the integrated system inside of the car to function together, right? You know, of course, there's uh, um, there are there are blockchains and smart contracts, which is another way of you know the way we look at blockchain and smart contracts are decentralized to serverless, right? You know, it's very, it's the development paradigm is exactly like serverless. You submit a, a piece of code, and you don't care where it is run, you don't care whose machine it's running on, but it gives you the result, right? You know, that's the uh, end. You pay for the result, and uh, except this uh, in this case, the servers are not run by a cloud provider, but by uh, a network of nodes, decentralized node, right? You know, so so all those use case scenarios, as you can see, you know, that's uh, um, would WebAssembly replace Docker in cloud computing? Um, probably not. But um, would it replace Docker where Docker cannot go today? For instance, on the edge cloud, or on constraint device, or on a SaaS environment? I think absolutely. You know, that's uh, uh, there's lots of use cases for that, as we see here. So the benefits of WebAssembly VM, you know, that's uh, um, because here we, it's a, it's a WASM data today. So I assume everybody are fairly familiar with those. You know, first of course, there's security, especially if important for untrusted code, like we talking about. You know, if you if you have a system where you allow people to upload code and you run it on their behalf, then you need some you need a sandbox, right? That's WebAssembly. That's what WebAssembly is for. And code that needs to access hardware, you know, that's. Uh, um, you know, um, in the IoT setting or in the artificial intelligence, you know, AI inference setting where code needs to access uh, specialized uh, chips that's, um, you know, that's that handles AI work. 
you know, those things have to be sandboxed. You can't have it uh, unrestricted access that would, um, you know, that would have, have a higher probability of crashing the system. Right? You know, it's very efficient and lightweight. That's what it's designed for. You know, it's uh, it has very it, it actually does very little. It's a uh, it's a uh, um, it's a security sandbox. And uh, as we can see from our previous, you know, the, the performance chart, it's has near native performance. It's just it runs as fast as uh, as compiled to the native code without a sandbox. So it has near native performance and. Due to its dynamic perform compiler optimization, such as AOT, it sometimes can even exceed native performance. You know, that's an interesting point. I wouldn't expand it here, but if you read our paper on uh, IEEE software, you see a discussion of it. Why the AOT compilation could generate code that is faster than native code, you know? And the runtime safety, you know, that's, um, I, I tend to think security and safety are different things. You know, security are um, other people want to attack you. Safety is, um, you know, the bugs you have in your own code that are going to crash the system, right? In the portability and platform independence, those are the, the old benefits of Java, you know, the, the benefits of basically any software VM, right? You know, that's, uh, you know, it allows you to, um, you know, uh, to, to develop on one machine and deploy it on another machine of a different operating system and architecture. And uh, it's especially important in edge computing where there are so many devices and CPUs these days, you know, it used to be the x86 is the dominant CPU on the server side, right? But now you have ARM, you have all kinds of you know, edge environments, you have all kinds of chips. So, you know, so it's important for a lightweight VM web assembly to run all those, all those hardware configurations. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it allows code to be, to be written on a developer's machine and then deployed everywhere uh, across the edge cloud. And the manageability, you know, that's, uh, because it's a container, so it should be managed and orchestrated like other containers by things like Kubernetes and you know, Kube Edge on, in, in the edge computing world. So it's automated deployment and ops, you know, it needs to support over the air deployments, right? you know, hot swapping with zero downtime. So, you know, that's if you update the software, you should be able to hot swap it out, in and out of the software module with no downtime. So the WebAssembly system interface is called WASI. And uh, that's what um, Solomon Hack is talking about in his tweet. And it allows WebAssembly not only to interface with the, with the browser, where it's, it's web browser where it's originally designed, but also with the operating system itself. So it's um, uh, interface with the file system, environment variables, network, and all that. So it allows um, the WebAssembly runtime to have access to all the operating, the host features that it runs on. So Wasm Edge is an open source project that we donated to CNCF. It's used as uh, a commercial version, it's called SSVM, second state VM. And it's, uh, it's a completely open source project. We developed from open source from day one and we wrote it um, specially optimized for uh, server side and um, you know, edge computing use cases. Uh, if you are interested, check it out and uh, you know, like it, fork it, and you know, discuss issues with us on GitHub. This is the paper that we published on IEEE software that shows the SSVM is, um, is already one of the fastest WebAssembly runtimes that's available in the market. So we, um, there's one particular thing that we like to add to the SSVM in context of serverless functions is that we, we want to build powerful WASI-like extensions. You know, WASI provide access to the host operating system. And we think, you know, why stop at libc and, uh, and the, the, the operating system level function calls? Why don't we make it a, make all the native functions available through WASI and through a very organized and very polished API that's available as a Rust SDK as well? So we can do uh, TensorFlow inference, which I which I talked about in another talk. And we can do storage. We can do um, blockchain stuff. That's uh, you know access instead of the file system, the blockchain account system through our um, WebAssembly runtime. The cloud native features are the ones that I talked about, you know, in, in the previous slides, which to um, is to through so OCI compliance allows the whole thing to be managed and orchestrated by Kubernetes. Well, so you know, a serverless function written in WebAssembly is really simple. You know, here's a here's a complete function. You know, it's to say hello. You know, let's take a string, and then if you read a little bit of Rust, it's uh, it's append hello in front of this string and it returns it back. Right. The way I I've just shown is a serverless function where you can uh, you can access to a URL, right? You know, it's a serverless function that's on the back end of a Jamstack application. And here is another here is another example that's that's uh, that we talked about is a uh, is a chatbot example in a, in a in a messaging application where 
you have a serverless mode, you upload a piece of code like this to the, uh, to the max messaging application platform and then specify um, a hook to say, if I received any message, call this function. And uh, it will tell you what the, 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 the message is received, from which user it's come from, and they ask you to provide a response, right? You, come, you provide a response. And then uploading and running this function, you don't have to, you no longer have to run your own server and do the API calls, or do the API callbacks for the tweak stand SaaS applications. So there are lots of um, live demos, you know, especially for the Jamstack application use case. We have a lot of AI demos where you can write serverless functions to do TensorFlow inference, to do image recognition and all that. All the source codes are available and uh, you can deploy them in minutes and see, see the result yourself. And you can even try the live, live demo. There's lots of them on our website. And there's also a lot of tutorials about, you know, writing server-side WebAssembly applications and also, how to how to optimize them for the for for, for Wasm Edge and SSVM. All right, I think uh, my time's up, and uh, um, thank you very much. And uh, check out our um, GitHub repository and website. And uh, I hope to see you there. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye.